Hi, everyone. Crypto Damas here from the Crypto Damas Astrology Report. I've got a special guest with us today, uh, Dan Waits from the World Astrology Report. He's an expert in mundane astrology, historical analysis, and future predictions. So we're going to hopefully try to pin him down on some predictions for 2024 here. And uh, thanks for joining us, Dan. Thanks for having me. So we're going to look at, uh, mainly we're going to look at some of the upcoming things. Uh, both of us agree that there's a high potential for some type of major global crisis in April of 2024. Um, not necessarily, I don't want to like freak everybody out, not necessarily on the level of the 2020 uh, pandemic crisis. Uh, probably, you know, that was a really exceptional, <laughs> that was a really exceptional alignment there, Saturn-Pluto year. Saturn Pluto conjunction year and Jupiter exaggerated the problems and blew everything out of way out of proportion. So it's not quite like that, but we do have some eclipse seasons. We have some very unusual eclipses coming up, especially the April 8th one, which we're going to talk about a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, a whole bunch of other things. Um, the Mars, the conjunction of the malefics, which falls about April 10th, two days after the eclipse. So that's a kind of a clusterfuck uh, combination right there, which I think we're going to discuss. Um, but how are you enjoying Pluto in Aquarius uh, so far? What are your thoughts on that? What have you noticed? I mean, um, it's been in, a, let's see, we have about what, uh, five, six, seven weeks now of Pluto in Aquarius round two. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's been super interesting to to watch. Um, I think we, we already had a, a taster of Pluto in Aquarius in 2023 in, in spring. And I think uh, I would say that this second ingress of Pluto in, in Aquarius, it hasn't been quite as um, dramatically obvious, you know, that, that we've really, things have really changed as it was in uh, March of last year. Because uh, I think at that time, it was it was really noticeable. There was so much noise around, you know, AI, for example. At that time, it was really exploding, and we were people. I think were realizing that okay, this is a significant breakthrough that's going to change the world in in ways we're not really sure about yet. And um, I'd say in the second ingress, we've seen or we're starting to see some of the same themes coming up, but I think uh, maybe in less, uh, perhaps less sort of explosively obvious ways but i think uh, it's been really interesting to watch i mean if you look at some of the things that are, that are happening the one thing to think about is how aquarius is the opposing sign to leo um, and leo being the sign of royalty and centrality and somehow we look at what's happening with the the british royal family um obviously we've got king charles as mm. has cancer but there, there were also um lots of rumors about issues with other members of the royal family um, Kate Middleton is also uh, sick and has disappeared from view for quite some time. Um, you know, there's a lot swirling around um, around the, the British royal family. Well, the, and if you British look back, the royals have figured into the Pluto and Aquarius for like centuries. <clears throat> yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, if you go back to the to the the last time that Pluto was in Aquarius in the late 18th century, you know, we had the American Revolution sort of um, severing. The, the the American, the new republic severing itself from King George. You go back to the one before that in the 16th century, and we have Henry VIII making himself the, you know, the head of the Church of England, separating himself from the Pope. So, yeah, the British royal family has featured previously in these these transits, and, and it's coming up in quite a loud way. Uh, again, and this Charles time. Charles was coronated like a few like weeks right uh, on the initial ingress. Of Pluto and yes. too. Yes, yes. That one, that's, a, what... that's interesting because in the in the whatever it was, the 1630s, you know, the the uh King Henry the Eighth was kind of playing the revolutionary, challenging the authority of the Pope in that Pluto in Aquarius version. And then the, you know, fast forward a couple hundred years, and then the Americans are are now the revolutionaries challenging the hegemony of the British colonial power. Um, so it's interesting that um, the King of England particularly uh, has played such a huge role in, in Pluto uh, in Pluto and Aquarius. And, and as, as you said, one, once again, slightly, maybe slightly less dramatic, although he's involved in a huge power struggle sort of with his son in, in the media and these books and like innuendos and flying rumors and all this stuff. 
Um, so this time it's kind of it's like almost within from the uh, it's an infighting within the royal the royal family. But certainly Prince Harry has challenged the you know power and authority of the of, of, of the royal family. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I wanted to say is um, uh, about the Pluto and Aquarius. Uh, you know, I definitely agree with you. Like last year when Pluto went into Aquarius, it was like the AI was just in the news like every day, right? It was just like, oh my God. Everyone was like, have you tried chat GPT? Oh my God, you know? And 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 yeah, it's, it's like kind of like, it's still in the news. It's still happening and stuff like that, but it's not as like explosive. However, like the AI stocks continue to just go ballistic uh, and they've been outperforming and really they've been the leaders of the stock market, uh, leading a huge unprecedented stock market rally with Pluto and Aquarius. So AI has really been driving an enormous uh, stock market bull market. Um, and also for crypto, uh, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, Pluto and Aquarius has been extremely good for crypto, uh, starting with the ingress last year. And once again, uh, since Pluto's ingress in January, we've seen, I think Bitcoin's almost almost gone up 50% just since the ingress. And Aquarius, of course, uh, is one of the most crypto-friendly signs, the sign of the futuristic new technology and cutting-edge technology. So um, definitely yeah. uh, we're seeing on the in the markets a huge effect. And also I think like the, um, you know, the Optimus Prime, the Tesla's new robot, um it's pretty amazing this robotics the innovations there so uh yeah we're going to continue to see a lot more of these technological breakthroughs no ab absolutely i think <clears throat> i think with regards uh bitcoin you can see a really interesting story there uh in terms of if you follow pluto's movements around what's happened with bitcoin because uh pluto moved into capricorn 2008 right at the time when bitcoin was born right at the time of the the great financial crisis of that time. Fast forward, you know, about 15 years, 16 years to where we are now. And Bitcoin is right in the heart of the financial system. You know, we have this uh, ETF. So yeah. it's gone from something right. that was just, just, you know, just came into existence, started Pluto and Capricorn, to now something that, I mean, has really been accepted by um, the most of the major financial institutions in the US now. It's it's quite stunning to see the change. Yeah, and the spot ETFs actually were approved, I think it was January 10th or so, uh, 10 days before uh, the second ingress of Pluto into Aquarius. No coincidence there. Um, and, um, you know, I've said for many years, if you look at the Bitcoin natal chart, it's the Terminator. It, it has a, a that, uh, you know, stellium of Sun, Mars, Pluto conjunction. Like, it absolutely will not stop. It cannot be stopped. It can only be slowed down. And sure enough, it's it's slowly kind of integrating and kind of its way into the, the mainstream financial system. So with some of the biggest institutions in the world, BlackRock and Fidelity coming in. Uh, so yeah, Pluto and Aquarius, you know, I think it's going to be good. Uh, it's going to be great for crypto. And I think 2024 is going to be an excellent year for crypto. We've got the halving coming up, the Bitcoin supply reduction, and that falls almost to the day of the Jupiter Uranus conjunction. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's a strange coincidence. <laughs> I think that's going to be extremely bullish uh, for crypto as well. Um, but any more yeah, about is... Pluto and Aquarius before we move on to the next subject? Yeah, I mean, if we look at, you know, I mentioned the royal family, but if we try and like zoom out a bit and, and think, you know, what's kind of going on archetypally with hmm. Pluto in Aquarius, and, and if we look back at those previous <laughs> transits and think, you know, what's the what's the common theme? And I think <clears throat> I think that what the theme has to do with the theme of the center um, versus the versus new centers. So Leo is the sign of things that are central as the sun. And Aquarius is the opposing sign. And what we tend to see with Pluto in Aquarius is the formation of new centers or, or challenges to the center. So, you know, if you look, if you think about um, the uh, the formation of the American Republic, you know, separation from the, the British Empire or going back, you know, Henry VIII's um, separation from the Pope. So there's there are challenges to the center or people are saying, well, we're not accepting that center. Um, we're establishing a new one over here. And that that often 
is what you, what you see with these transits. And I think um, you can also see that if you look at the sort of geopolitical situation, there is a challenge to the, the current order that we've mm. si that we had in the world, right? We've had, a, I think most people would agree, we've had this uni unipolar world order since the fall of the Soviet Union with the US being by far the most powerful state in the world. And now we're seeing challenges to that, particularly coming from China and then, you know, China's allies, Russia, et cetera. Um, they're, they're saying, you know, we, we, we want a new kind of order. We want to, um, we want a multipolar order or perhaps, you know, something, something different. And so I think you can see that theme there. And it was, there was a lot in the um, ingress of Pluto into Aquarius in 2023. There was a lot of noise about this BRICS group, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. That's been expanding, right? It's it's expanded. They're taking on new members now. Now, a lot of people scoff at BRICS. They say, oh, it's just a talking shop. It's not real. It's bullshit, et cetera. But I'm, I'm not so sure. I think the way that it's fitting what the symbols are saying and what has happened historically, I don't think it, I think it would be foolish to kind of write it off. Now, that's not to say that... Um, that's not to say that we're, we're necessarily going to have a world in which, say, Beijing is the new center, but we might have, I think, some sort of rebalancing where there is um, some sort of settlement at the end of this that mm -hmm. looks a bit different to what we've had so far. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, I agree with what you're saying. You know, uh, Pluto and Aquarius is, is famous uh, historically over the centuries for challenges to the status quo power structure. That's that's kind of how I see it. Um and, you know, even uh, Copernicus, you know, uh, saying that uh, the sun was the center of the solar system and not the earth, you know, was a huge sort of paradigm shift to the status quo, uh, both scientific and religious kind of orders, right? So we could see some major uh, challenges to the status quo power structures, whether it's going to be bricks, I mean, or something else. Popular uprisings also, I mean, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, revolutionary, we have, you know, we haven't seen, we haven't seen anything quite like that yet. I know everybody's been, you know, talking about that, but Pluto is going to be in Aquarius for 20 years, so we got some time. Um, Iran looked like, you know, maybe something was happening there, but of course, uh, they, they, the, the regime was able to shut that down. I think Iran, though, is a deeply pop unpopular you know, religious fanatic regime, they're very ripe for uh, uh, a, some kind of overthrow there. Uh, so that's that's a place to watch. Uh, that place is, you know, um, a tinderbox that could go up at any time. You know, Russia, I mean, Putin's had to clamp down on anti-war protest. Uh, it's hard to imagine, you know, um, something happening there. But I think the war is really probably not very popular. And uh, yeah, I think something could happen inside Russia, a totalitarian, you know, state with no freedom of the press, no freedom of speech, no freedom to protest. Uh, we could see some kind of an uprising there against uh, the regime. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, but it'll be interesting to see how it, how it plays out. I mean, China, you know, their economy is in a very weakened state right now, actually. So they're not exactly poised to like take over the world economy. Uh, in fact, uh, the opposite. Um, and um, so we'll see. It's hard to know where the, I mean, certainly, I mean, certainly the Hamas challenged the status quo sort of situation in the Middle East. Uh, that's one thing we can say for sure. I mean, you know, uh, and the repercussions, you know, are going on now all over, all over the Middle East, right? Um, and really destabilizing, potentially really destabilizing the, the region. So there was kind of this status quo skirmishes between Israel and Hamas for years, right? But it never, it never really, it, they never, neither side would ever really go so far as to provoke the other one the way that they did last year. And that's really, really changed the dynamics. So obviously that could create all sorts of unexpected things to come in the, in 2024. Yeah, and um, if you if you consider like when when that happened, uh, it, it happened in October of last year when there was this uh, eclipse in Libra. You know, Libra is a sign of right. balance Peace and diplomacy. harmony. <laughs> yeah, and we we you know that 
any kind of uneasy balance, if you could call it that. Obviously, it wasn't a. I don't think it's it's a very asymmetrical situation, but that was shattered basically yeah. in October, and we yeah. have another Libra eclipse uh, coming uh, towards the end of this month. Right, and I mean the South Node, which is kind of a weakening influence in Libra for you know about an eighteen month period. So the sign, everything rule, you know, everything ruled by Libra which again, yeah, it's the peace and love and diplomacy and negotiation and really listening to the other side is <laughs> not happening. I mean, just look at social media discourse. We were just talking about this. Um, not a lot of like listening to the other side, which is a really a Libra quality, not a lot of peace and negotiation, negotiation or diplomacy in the Middle East or in, um, or in Ukraine, right? I mean, diplomacy is in an incredibly weakened state with these South Node eclipses. Uh, so I don't, yeah, it's not, um, and that's going to continue uh, for another, I think the South Node's only about halfway through there. So, and of course the North Node is in this, the war sign of Aries, strengthening uh, strengthening uh, that sign and all the things, you know, so uh, that dynamic, I think we're seeing obviously play out. But uh, so that's great segue into this March 25th eclipse. And I'm going to put that eclipse up here. Uh, and I have it, of course, I have it set for Seattle, which is where I'm located. Uh, of course, the houses and the ascendant and so forth would would change. But uh, the eclipse is basically going to be about uh, five, uh, eight, five degrees, eight minutes of Libra, something like that. Uh, <clears throat> and basically, uh, the eclipse is the only really major aspect is uh, a trine to Pluto and Aquarius. Uh, so it's going to be activating Pluto and Aquarius. Now, trines tend to be, you know, harmonious, good aspects uh, that we like, but eclipses and Pluto, <laughs> you know, that's not, it's not my favorite combination uh, because uh, eclipses are dark and edgy and Pluto is dark and edgy. Um, and, uh, you know, eclipses, I really, I really think of eclipses uh, as a kind of a shadowy, you know, shadow uh, energy, right? Like the Jung talked about the shadow, which is like these disowned aspects of our own consciousness and the collective consciousness. Um, and just, you know, uh, anger and hate and racism and bigotry and greed and jealousy, these kind of really intense negative emotions can be intensified under eclipses, both just in interpersonal relationships, but also in global politics too. And in markets, you can see um, sentiment go to extremes on eclipses. Now, not every time, but they're just, they have an extreme uh, quality to them. They have a shadowy quality to them. Um, and uh, we often, you know, have to deal with difficult circumstances during eclipses. Um, now, you were talking about eclipses. You had a slightly different, I think, view on it. Um, just the generally speaking kind of eclipse energy. What were you saying when we were talking about that before? Uh, I was, I, th I think I was, I, I can't remember exactly what I was, what I was saying before, <laughs> but, but um, I you know the way I see eclipses is that they're, they're kind of, they're moments that, that harb, you know, harbingers of, of great change. Somebody on Twitter, and I f I'm going to apologize because I forget who it was, but they had a really interesting analogy for eclipses because Eclipses are moments when the light of the luminaries, the sun and moon is blocked out for temporarily. And uh, they liken this to, it's kind of, you're at the theater and they they turn the lights off and then suddenly the set is changed. You know, there's a, so the lights go out and then they come back on again and the world is different. The, the set is different. And so, you know, that's that's a little bit what we can tend to expect with eclipses, they're harbingers of, of change, uh, beginnings and and endings. And yes, there's definitely, uh, there tends to be a lot of emotional energy mm. around them as well. Um, if you think about a lunar eclipse, which is what we're, we're getting at the end of this month, it's it's rather like a, a full moon, but just much stronger. And as you say, it's trying to Pluto. And I'm not really a fan of trines to pluto necessarily i mean i think pluto's just pluto just does pluto uh regardless of the aspect although if it's a trine well, perhaps it might offer better you a than gift an as well. opposition it is it is <laughs> but it's it's still it's still plutonic and plutonic experiences aren't necessarily 
easy. But I'd, I'd say one of the things about this eclipse, which might somewhat take the edge off, is the the fact that at least the ruler, Venus, is quite dignified. It's in the sign of Pisces, yeah. where it's exalted. Um, so it's another Libra eclipse. We can think of with a south node activated as a south node eclipse. So you, you can think of um, this sort of rebalancing or renegotiating um, uh, the shattering of harmonies and so on. But this time, perhaps with the ruler being a bit more powerful, because last time in October, uh, Venus was in fall in Virgo. Now Venus is exalted. Um, perhaps there might be a, a bit more... Um, the, the, the rebalancing could be less rough, potentially. Um, but I think with the, the astrology that's following in April, yeah. uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet too heavily on you know kind of everything kind of looking too great either. Yeah. So and I mean it's exalted, but it is conjunct Saturn. It's separating, but still within four degrees. So there's a it's also a kind of a Saturn tone there, just in the background. And I mean, um, yeah, just going back to the actual sort of ast astronomy of the eclipse, right? It's it's a full moon, which should be bright, but it's not bright. It's dark. <laughs> it's dark. And it's dark because the earth comes between the sun and the moon and then, uh, you know, casts a shadow. So, uh, again, coming back to the shadow uh, elements of, you know, and like you had mentioned, it's in the sign of Libra, um, which is the sign of, of, you know, relationships and love and marriage. Uh, so one of the things is that we could see some prominent divorces, perhaps. Uh, I think we saw that last time as well. It's like as soon as the South Node moved into Libra, we started seeing all these like divorces, movie stars, you know, sort of high profile uh, players. Uh, I think the, the prime minister of Canada was like, um, so we could see like kind of notable relationship problems hit the media, stars, celebrities, politicians, so forth like that. Um, and, you know, this doesn't bode well for the ongoing wars uh, around the globe. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't um, help the situations. It doesn't, I mean, they're still trying to negotiate the ceasefire in Gaza, right? For weeks now, they can't get a ceasefire um, because both, you know, I'm just going to say both sides have been quite rigid in their positions. Um, and now we've got this humanitarian disaster on the ground, you know, in Gaza, it's, it's unconscionable. Uh, you know, uh, what's going on there. Certainly don't, you know, I, I, I support a ceasefire. I think, I think Israel has successfully self-defended itself and, and, and way beyond that. So, uh, you know, I think, I think it will hopefully maybe that, you know, there can't, hopefully there can be a ceasefire, but this, this full moon isn't, isn't that great. I'll also just throw out there that this full moon, uh, excuse me, this eclipse is very badly positioned in the Bitcoin natal chart as, you know, I'm kind of famous for my work uh, on the Bitcoin uh, financial astrology. And one of the things that we've been predicting is that we, we could see a correction. You know, we've had a Bitcoin rally going on now for, for six months. And uh, we might have a little bit of a cooling off period. Uh, this eclipse is in an exact square to the Bitcoin natal Mars at five Capricorn. Um, I don't think it's going to be a dramatic crash or anything like that because um, it is a bull market year. And I, but it it is a place that we're looking at for some type of a s prolonged correction or a sideways consolidation. Um, and it's trying to Pluto. So it is going to activate Pluto in Aquarius, uh, which is why we opened with Pluto in Aquarius, right? So Pluto in Aquarius is, is a huge factor. It's going to be activated here, but I think it's going to bring out the dark side. So I would, I would be expecting that we're going to see a lot more stories about how AI is going to completely destroy humanity and uh, robots are going to take over and, you know, Terminator and Skynet and really the darker side, the darker side of these new technological breakthroughs, uh, you know, <clears throat> that we're, that we're talking about. I mean, either AI is going to take all our jobs or it's going to actually totally destroy humanity. Right. Or it's going to save humanity. Um, so, but I, I do think like, you know, and we saw the, the recent story come out about the Russians are going to put nuclear weapons in space to take out satellite networks and disable uh, that kind of, you know, stuff like to disable uh, any anything on the grounds, uh, you know, and, and interfere with um, U.S. intelligence and so forth like that. So nukes in space, I mean, that's another like a Pluto and Aquarius story. 
Um, what are, what are some other like dark side, technological dark side, sci-fi, you know, apocalypse scenarios that we could come up with for this eclipse? I mean, one thing, one thing that it, it's not quite apocalyptic, but uh, something that we've we're also starting to see with um, this AI technology is uh, how it can be used for to create deep fake porn and things like that. Um, I think kind of Libra being a very relational sign to rule by Venus, um, something you know, those kind of themes might might come up. Um, so how how this this technology is you know affecting relations between between human beings but that's not quite um quite so so apocalyptic unless um, somebody hacks your your ai sex robot and, and and it tries to kill you well there's always there's always that there's always that risk i would stay away from those things if i <laughs> if i if, if i were, were watching um yeah so so i th i think um you know the the whole theme of cyber war is heating up quite a bit you can you're starting to hear more and more about it as you as you correctly said and pluto does have this uh resonance with the theme of of war conflict death destruction and so on um i think that's a distinct possibility i mean the eclipse is in an air sign as well um so we have to factor that in you know air has to do with connection connectivity mm, yeah. um, and drones might... drone wars um also, the drones being um, such a huge factor in modern warfare now, like these robot AI, not AI drones, but certainly, yeah, just drone warfare in the air, taking over the air. Yeah, and what's interesting about that and how I think it connects to Pluto and Aquarius is obviously in a quite a literal way, given that Aquarius is an air sign um, and we have these weapons that fly through the air, but also in the way that it, it, uh, potentially drones are going to change the kind of calculus of war change the calculus of power because you can manufacture drones suicide drones relatively cheaply compared to you know, the really expensive weaponry that, you know, that let's say that the great powers have um what this what these new weapons enable is for um less financially powerful entities states groups to do some serious damage and I think we're seeing that a little bit um, with uh, the what's happening with the the Houthis in Yemen. I believe they've been using um, been using drone attacks, mm -hmm. and so these are relatively relatively cheap weapons that can have big effects. So it's kind of allowing um, a rebalancing of power somehow. Um, in that you know, the 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 Houthis in Yemen have been able to pretty much bring. Um, trade through the gulf of aden on through the suez canal to a to a halt um using relatively affordable uh weapons so there's always that as well i think that's that's going to be playing through the dynamics of the of the coming years and whenever we see pluto in aquarius it's heavily stimulated it's it's quite likely that we'll see those themes coming in to the news well, let's go ahead to the following eclipse, which is on April 8th. And this one is, I think, quite a bit more dramatic. Um, let me just get the exact lineup here. This one is a lot more worrisome to me personally than the March 25th eclipse. Uh, <clears throat> and this is a really kind of an, a very unique and unusual alignment. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm just getting over a cold here, so I apologize. Uh so it's going to line up at 1924. Um, and let me just get that exact lineup. But what are your thoughts on this eclipse while I'm just working on lining this up? Um, what yeah. is uh, exalted in exalted and eclipsed in Aries, the war, the war sign. Right, right. So, yeah, as you say, Aries, a sign where the sun is exalted. And if we, if we think about eclipses in general, going back to the the very early days of astrology, um, the Babylonian period, eclipses have always been associated, particularly solar eclipses, with rulers, with uh, monarchs and leaders of different kinds. And so we, when, when the sun is essentially blocked out, the sun, that which is central, is somehow blocked out. It's 
it's hidden. So we, you know, whenever we see a solar eclipse, and particularly maybe with this one, because as you say, this is where the sun is exalted. So we're thinking about very visible people, very central, um, powerful leaders. Um, we might see their, you know, their somehow um, being removed from power or, you know, having serious problems. Um, what I, uh, what I've noticed about this eclipse is I actually looked back at the last time we were having eclipses in the sign of Aries. And in fact, in 2005, we had uh, a solar eclipse in a very close position to this one. So if you go back one whole nodal cycle, when you look at what happened in April to 8th of April, 2005, when we had an eclipse almost at exactly the same place. Um, Which was the, the last time the, no the North node was in Aries. Yes, South node yes, exactly, Europe. exactly. Exactly. And what happened at this time, we had, well, Pope John Paul II died mm. at that time. So, you know, there are there are a few people that are more visible and sensual somehow than than the Pope. We have one of these eclipses and, you know, a Pope dies. Something else that happened at that time, which is kind of interesting uh, when you think about what's going on right now, is that uh, Charles married Camilla. So King Ch who's now King Charles, Queen Camilla, they got married at the last time there was an eclipse at this place. And you, know, you can't help but note that Charles is currently rather sick. We don't know exactly how sick, um, but you know, uh, Camilla has been filling in, hmm. um, doing some, some of the royal duties. I understand she's on holiday now or something like that. Um, so those, you know, those two figures who are prominent in the news right now, they got married at the last time there was an eclipse, almost at exactly the same position. I think that's, that's, hmm. That's pretty interesting. And I would also wonder about the, um, you know, the U.S. leadership race. Um, I would not be at all surprised to see changes to that if there were um, candidates uh, maybe pulling out, uh, particularly important candidates, perhaps um, around around this time. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Well, and this, what's really unusual about this eclipse is that it is an exact to the minute conjunction to Chiron. Uh, you've got quite, I mean, you've got quite the lineup here in Aries, uh, just generally speaking. I mean, Venus, the North Node, the Sun, Chiron, Moon, and you've also got Venus, you've also got Mercury retrograde, <laughs> which is just another factor uh, that makes this more complicated. Uh, so Mercury is going to go retrograde a few days before the eclipse, right? And it's retrograding towards the eclipse. It's in orb of a conjunction to the eclipse. So actually, Mercury retrograde is part of the eclipse. Um, and then unfortunately, the most unfortunate, and to me, one of the most concerning aspects is not just the exact conjunction to Chiron, but the Lord uh, ruler of the eclipse is Mars, and it's an approaching conjunction to Saturn, which is what we call the conjunction of the malefics. Now, even if there wasn't an eclipse, just having a conjunction of the malefics, which happens about every two to two and a half years, is associated with misfortune, epidemics, wars, and just difficult, bad circumstances. Um, by the way, just to give you an example, Sam Bankman-Fried, one of the most notorious uh, scammers of the 21st century, had an exact Mars-Saturn conjunction natally <laughs> in Aquarius. Uh, so if you want to know about misfortune, uh, that is he's a great example of the conjunction of the malefics. Also, I, I mean, I've gone back and studied the uh, conjunction of the malefics over the years. Uh, we saw the Ebola outbreaks in West Africa, the, the really, really dramatic Ebola outbreaks that happened about a decade ago. Uh, that was on a Mars-Saturn um, uh, 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 conjunctions. Um, we had, we saw actually uh, that time where like the Hezbollah kidnapped like some of the Israeli military guys, like three or four of their guys. And then Israel bombed Beirut back to the Stone Age. Uh, so uh, we've seen some pretty dramatic stuff. It's This is not good. Um, and in this case, it's in Pisces. So I would be expecting some problems uh, that have to do with the oceans, global climate change, um, warming oceans, coral reef destruction. Um, uh, there could be some, yeah, some type of flooding or storms, weather uh, a crisis events, or 
or uh, what we were talking about earlier, something with this issue of the Houthis and the um, global maritime traffic, or we could see some kind of maritime naval battle take place, uh, maybe between the U.S. and the Houthis, or God, hopefully not the Iranians, uh, but certainly um, it's possible. Um, so, yeah, this eclipse, I mean, the conjunction to Chiron, you know, Chiron's a very difficult planet. Um, Chiron, if you read the story of Chiron, it's a story, it's a tragic story of betrayal and, and great suffering. It's not a happy story. Um, Chiron was, he was a gifted healer. So it does have this connotation, you know, it's the wounded healer. And if you want to know more about Chiron, you know, the Melanie Griffith, uh, Melanie, uh, Melanie Reinhardt, excuse me, <laughs> Melanie Reinhardt's book, uh, Chiron, the wounded healer is great. And uh, Chris Brennan interviewed her for like three hours on the astrology podcast. There's a great episode on Chiron. Um, but yeah, it's not a happy story. It's a story of trauma and great suffering. Um, and so, you know, I think this eclipse is very dark. I think it's very worrisome. And um, Chiron, you know, represents these kind of unsolvable problems and unhealable wounds. And, um, you know, how is that going to show up? You know, what do you, yeah, what are the ideas? Yeah. So and Chiron is these unhealable wounds. The other, the other thing about, about Chiron is that Chiron was also a healer himself so you might also wonder about themes to do with medicine and healing and and so on Definitely. those kind of those kind of um themes and you mentioned earlier you know could we see a new a new outbreak of something somehow yeah, an epidemic um, yeah an epidemic exactly um something something and something that comes to mind is that uh the sign of Pisces, where Mars, the ruler of this eclipse, is happening, is conjunct Saturn. Mars is Mars is applying to Saturn, yeah. so you know Mars is a planet that wants to move. Saturn doesn't want to move, right? They're, these are they're, they're, that's the difference between these two planets. Saturn <laughs> wants to move slowly. Saturn wants to you know proceed cautiously, carefully over long distances, long amount you know uh, long periods of time. Mars is like, no, let's go, let's get things done, let's take action etc so that's why you know these two planets are quite a tricky combination and so there can be some there can be some uh you know feel it, some sense of great pressure yeah. or great frustration and then kind of explosive releases when you see these two uh planets together um and unfortunately the fact they, they, oh, i'm sorry they they yeah they, i was just gonna say they they accentuate the, the malefic quality of each other yeah, because that's the one thing they agree on. <laughs> they, they're, they're well, they're both dry planets, but they also they're both malefics, and so yes, the 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 malefic um, nature of both is is going to be heightened. And um, the other thing I would would say as well is this is a sign of Pisces. Now Pisces um, is also, as you mentioned, to do with oceans, but oceans are about what they're 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 about flow. Everything is connected in an ocean. It's, there's a sort of oneness to an ocean, and I, I see Pisces as having to do with um, things that connect everything together, um, like the global, as I said earlier, global trade network, the flow of that, how things flow, but also currency, people. Um, with Saturn in Pisces, we've seen uh, there's a, in a lot of um, news about migration, a lot of a lot of conflict over you know what to do about that particular issue, not just in the US but all over the world. So but this is Piscean because it's about the flow. It's about the, the flow of people. Saturn, however, is kind of saying, um, do we need limits or restrictions on this? And so that's you know one of the things that people are, are arguing about right now. Um, but I would say that with this eclipse being ruled by these planets and Chiron being being involved. Um, you, you might wonder about restrictions to flow uh, as well. And th that could mean restrictions to the flow of people. One possibility, as you mentioned, if there's some sort of outbreak, you know, is there some, is there then, do, do certain parts of the world take action to prevent this thing from spreading? That's just, a, just, just one possibility. But I think yeah. the other things that you mentioned in terms of um, problems with the ocean, with flooding and so on, are all, are all very possible. Um, or oil spilled, and, or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, Mars is a speeding train, and Saturn, you know, is an immovable object. So, you know, the Mars-Saturn conjunction is a, it's a train wreck. <laughs> it's an aspect of a train wreck, 
it's an asp- it's a crisis aspect. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not, I mean, yeah, it, it's a really difficult aspect and it's, it is, it's very tense and we could, this is a period where we could see a big pullback in the markets also. Um, I mean, markets have been, the stock market's been on an unprecedented tear, except for today, <laughs> we had a rough day and maybe even could be starting to see that pullback forming. But, uh, you know, I think the stock market's been up 17 out of 19 weeks. That's historically unprecedented. Bitcoin and crypto has been on an, a, a ceaseless rampage for months. Uh, this would be a place uh, where there, there could be a correction. There could be a pullback uh, in the markets. Uh, the Mars Saturn is often indicates a pullback uh, in the markets. And so, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 really hard. It's really hard to put a good spin on this. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think yeah, it's, um, it needs to happen. Um, this is a clearing. This isn't a clearing of the air. This is a time where the shit has to come down um, and then it will reorganize itself. Yeah, then, I, I think the other... good we can find in this alignment. <laughs> Something uh, hopeful for the people. <laughs> something hopeful for the people. Um, well, I would say, you know, that this is an alignment that that may that might not feel good, yeah. but it, on an individual basis, it might show you where work needs to be done. Right. So I I character personally, building. Character character building. Where are the more where are the problems? More character building. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can we can all usually all you know do with a bit more character. I don't, don't you can have too much, and uh, it, you know this might if you pay attention to you know what happens in your own life around this time, you know you can you can see where exactly that where work needs to be done. Where do you need to perhaps um, uh, get stronger or build something? You know Mars is taking action and Saturn is structures and so on. So there could be something around that. I, I think it's always important to try and um take a a stance of kind of trying to learn from 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 uh the things that happen that are signified by the astrology sometimes things just happen where there doesn't really seem to be anything to be learned from it's just pure misfortune but but i don't i think that's less common than maybe some people think i, th- I think usually there is something that you can take from it so that's what i would say uh, just to, just to also point out um just on a mundane basis these conjunctions, as you said, happen every two years or so. And this was a cycle, this two-year cycle was used by traditional astrologers to kind of time, um, let's say, m- misfortunate events. And so if we look at the last couple of these cycles, we had one of these in early 2020, around the time that the uh, COVID pandemic was was getting going. And then at the major aspects of this cycle, the hard aspects, we saw um, major new variants of COVID emerging. It really was timing developments in the pandemic we had another one of these uh conjunctions i believe right. it was a- april 2022 right at the start of the, the the ukraine war and and actually you can trace the major aspects of that cycle between mm. 2022 and now um you see you see de- big developments in in that conflict and um i think what what this astrology of of april is setting up is the new two year story what's the new thing that's probably going to be on a lot of our minds unfortunately some people are going to be directly affected by whatever it is probably and, and, and others less so um but i think the the astrology of april is is actually it's all piling up there's a lot happening at once and i i don't think i'd be surprised if there's anybody who's not affected in in some way um pisces is this has this kind of universal kind of feel to it um as i said it's like oceanic we're all kind of we're all part of the ocean um the other thing I would mention is that comes to mind is the theme of liquidity. Uh, I, I do wonder about some sort of liquidity yeah. crunch True. with Mars and Saturn. Well, when Sa- yeah. Yeah, Saturn's ingress into Pisces, we saw a major banking crisis in the United States. And that was a liquidity crisis, uh, which is, you know, Pisces uh, is, is, is I mean, we usually think of liquid waters and oceans and water, but sometimes it's a metaphorical liquidity as well. So, yeah, that's a good catch. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a really, you know, the, <clears throat> I gave two lectures in, in, in 2019 entitled the clump, the coming global crisis of 2020, right? One of the things about astrology is we can use it to warn and prepare, 
it's a double-edged sword, right? Because that can create anxiety, but at the same time, at least we're sort of mentally prepared for what could happen. And um, so we want to prepare people for what's about to happen, but we don't want to sort of like fear monger about it and have people in a state of anxiety. It's really a tricky balance, right? You don't want to sugarcoat it, but you don't want to exaggerate it. Uh, and so this is one of those times where you have to find the right balance, right? This will be a time, this could be a difficult time where people will be very stressed. Um, and um, it's a time, uh, it's a good time to practice meditation and <laughs> equanimity and uh, letting go and patience. You know, Mars Saturn is a very frustrating aspect. And the antidote to that is, is practicing patience. And, you know, this will pass waiting for more uh, fruitful, prosperous, better, better times. Um, but let's go on to the next, the last thing we want to talk about today, which is about, uh, about, uh, 12 days later or so, uh, we'll get that uh, Jupiter-Uranus uh, conjunction, which is uh, maybe a little bit more uh, positive. I mean, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that this Jupiter-Uranus conjunction, as they always are, is kind of a, a mixed bag. Um, now, there's, there's two main things that these conjunctions tend to be uh, related to, broadly speaking. Right. And the first one is sort of cultural and technological breakthroughs. As we discussed earlier, you know, you mentioned um, there was one of these in 1969 with the Apollo landings. Um, uh, there was one of them in 1983, which was generally seen as the year that the Internet was born with the TCP IP protocol. Um, so you do get these sort of big technological and cultural breakthroughs with these conjunctions. Um, Jupiter you know, has to do with wisdom and truth, um, particularly. And um, Uranus is a planet of revelation. So there's these kind of sudden new breakthroughs and revelations and, and so on, these really kind of impressive things that, that can happen in these conjunctions. So, um, so from that perspective, yeah, there's there's definitely a good side to the to these conjunctions. I think in people's individual lives, they can be there can be um, really uplifting kind of moments in a surprising Uranian way, but at the same time, there are also there are also moments where we see sparks lit. Um, Uranus is a planet that, that that will tend to signify sudden jarring events where yeah. where things are kind of the the the, the table is suddenly rearranged. Um, Jupiter has this expansive quality. Things are can 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 um, sort of move outwards with Jupiter, and so you put these two together, and you get these sort of explosive kind of moments or sparks. And if you look at when some of these conjunctions have happened in the past, it's some of the really most important years in in history. You know, if you go, for example, we had one in 1775, American Revolutionary War. Then we have one 1789. We have the French Revolution. You can you can move forward to 1914. This is the, the year that the First World War broke that out. That was also a Saturn-Pluto uh, conjunction year, so <laughs> there's uh, other factors. Yeah, of course. There's always other. There's always other factors, and we're you know when we're when we're doing this, we're kind of teasing the factors apart. But of course, what we're you know what 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 we're ideally aiming towards is bringing them all together at the same time, which is of course extremely difficult because you you need the mind of God to do it totally successfully. But that's what we're aiming to do. Uh, as astrologers so yeah and then you know more recently uh 2010 11 there were three of these conjunctions uh that kind of timed the break the the arab spring as well um oh, so yeah. there's these kind of moments yeah. of kind of liberatory activity where people move towards freedom but of course this can also um involve violence and as we've seen in the past and i think if you're looking at if you consider what else is going on? So we have this difficult eclipse, we have this Mars-Saturn conjunction, and then we just have the state of the world as it is now. You know, I do wonder about the possibility for big shocks yeah. here and kind of the out and, and expanding violence. The other thing to, to bear in mind, actually, is that this Mars-Saturn conjunction is happening. Pisces and Jupiter is the ruler of Pisces traditionally, and it's conjunct Uranus in Taurus, which is a sign that has to do with wealth and um, finance and so on, um, things of value. So you, you'd again also wonder, is there some big financial or liquidity shock coming with this? That that would also not be too surprising. Well, I think um, I think there's going to be a supply shock for Bitcoin. 
because the increased demand from the ETFs is going to hit up against the reduction, the supply reduction of the halving, which is the four year uh, cycle of Bitcoin. And by the way, this Jupiter Uranus conjunction falls almost to the day that the having what the ha the minor reward having is scheduled for Bitcoin, uh, which only happens every four years. So uh, financially, I think that's really the event to watch. Um, and I think that's going to be incredibly good for cryptocurrencies, especially because Uranus is the ruler of cryptocurrencies. Um, and, uh, and, and as he said, it's in the sign of Taurus. It's also very well positioned in the Bitcoin natal chart. Um, but yeah, it's an asset. I have this aspect natally. So, um, <laughs> um, I think it's a great aspect. <laughs> Uh, it's an aspect. I wouldn't of, mind one of these in my chart. I'd be quite happy to have one. <laughs> it's an aspect of freedom and liberation. I mean, yeah, it, I like everything. It has a kind of a positive side and a more challenging side. It's an aspect of freedom and and liberation. You know, the expansive quality of Jupiter, uh, uh, together with the the freedom, uh, brilliant, innovative, uh, uh, you know, qualities of Uranus can be quite positive for scientific breakthroughs and technological innovations like the lunar landing, first man on the moon. You know, Woodstock was another event that's associated with the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. And that was like a huge cultural touchstone for the, the hippie movement, the countercultural movement of the 60s. And, you know, I think they they sold like 50, they thought 50,000 people were going to show up, but like 400,000 people showed up. And it shut down like the New York State Thruway. And then they they just they didn't have enough food. They had to airlift food and medical supplies in. The military did. Like it was a crazy it's interesting to watch the documentary about it because it was a total confusion. Uh, but it was also like this this beautiful peace and love moment where people came together and everybody supported each other. Uh, but it was, you know, that was one of the most momentous moments of the 1960s, really. So um, Jupiter Uranus, you know, on the other hand, right, Jupiter, I'll tell you, like, the longer I study astrology, the less I like Jupiter, <laughs> the more I like Saturn, because <laughs> Saturn is reliable. And you kind of know what you're getting with Saturn. With Jupiter, it's like, it's very unreliable. And Jupiter also can um, exaggerate problems and blow things out of proportion. And with Uranus, we're talking about sudden unexpected chaos, right? And coming on the heels of this eclipse and the Mars-Saturn conjunction, my fear is that there will be something that's extremely chaotic and surprising. Yeah. Uh, I, in a I, happy way. I, would, I wouldn't be... Yeah, surprise. I, mean, I think most astrologers are sort of bracing themselves a little bit uh, for April. I think um, yeah. it's kind of this month where you, you just want to hunker down, see what happens and then and then make <laughs> make whatever adjustments are needed based on on whatever happens. But the other I mean, the other thing that I've, I'd, I'd bear in mind as well is that Jupiter, Uranus and Taurus, it's definitely been signifying um, a lot of these uh farmer farmer protests i think you know uranus is very uh, is a planet we'd associate with um revolution and protests and so on and together with jupiter we've seen these protests all over all over europe and you know you also have to factor in this is taurus sign that's associated with farming and food um so that's also an area that could be ripe for disruption again we're already seeing it but as these two planets right. get closer together you can expect that dynamic to be heightened so i would also be looking out for that um you know maybe it wouldn't be a terrible idea to just have you know maybe make sure you've got some essentials in your cupboards <laughs> um a few cans canned food and so on um stock up on the dry goods again yes. um Hopefully it won't be that bad. Uh, we'll see how it goes. It's definitely, yeah, it's, 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 it's a month that, that has a very complex energies at in play. And, you know, one thing we were talking about before we started recording was uh, that this also has, this also could, um, this also could activate uh, Pluto and Aquarius because Uranus is considered the modern ruler of Aquarius. 
uh, which we were talking about, um, which, you know, neither me, neither me nor Dan would give Aquarius rising. Uh, we wouldn't give uh, Uranus as the ascendant Lord. That would be Saturn, the traditional ruler. But there is a strong affinity between Uranus, a planet of futuristic technologies and technological innovation and breakthroughs and the sign of Aquarius. Uh and uh, popular uprisings and this yearning for freedom to kind of go up against the oppressive status quo, right? I mean, Pluto and Aquarius is, is about like overthrowing the regime, right? And like starting a new, fresh, revolutionary kind of liberation, right? And so, uh, and so is the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction also. So again, uh, popular uprisings um, and liberation movements and uh, stuff like that could also be another thing that we're seeing that's very chaotic. Um, and also, again, the AI, the darker side of AI and um, and some of these other uh, robotics and some of these other technological breakthroughs. But yeah, something else. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say something else. Um, something else that comes to mind as well is uh, in 1858, there was one of these conjunctions of uh, Jupiter and Uranus in Taurus, that Taurus. sign in particular. Was that the um, last and, one in Taurus? No, the last one was 1941, but there was one before that in 1858. Oh. And um, at this 1858 conjunction, it was in May, almost exactly when that happened, um, Charles Darwin and um, I think the another, another fellow, I think he was called Alfred Russell Wallace, and they presented a paper on the theory of evolution by natural selection. Oh, wow. And so this... Yeah, so we got this like really revolutionary idea about um, about how we're materially constituted. Now, Taurus, the exaltation rule of Taurus is the moon, which rules the body, and so this is a you know real real new way of seeing um, the human being. So I wouldn't be too surprised if there were some interesting revelations about our perhaps our um, biology or origins or something like that. Um, perhaps coming through AI, you know, um, the because I think people are using AI yeah. to sift through large amounts of yeah. data. So I read an article that, about they're using AI to try to understand whale uh, songs, like to break to understand them. Yeah, to dissect, to translate the language that the whales speak to each other. Uh, yes. Yeah, kind of cool. Yeah, that's something I've been I, I've noticed myself as well. I, I think it's um, it's another theme that we can put down to Pluto and Aquarius because, you know, we as human beings, we think we're the center of everything, or at least a lot of us do. I mean, perhaps some more enlightened ones don't, but we tend to think that the, the human species is very central. And in some sense it, it, it may be, but you can see that one, this, this theme of like new centers or the decentering um, of those who thought they were at the center kind of happening over and over again. And what would kind of decenter us, more than say decoding whale song and figuring out, oh, these are actually sentient, intelligent animals, intelligent creatures, and that we've actually been, you know, acting as if they aren't, and that would force maybe force us to completely rethink how we approach those creatures in particular, and perhaps the, the the natural world in general more broadly. It could spark some new process of like re-evaluating. How do we see and treat animals? So that's another thing that I'm 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 wondering about. Well, we got to wrap this up. We're going a little over time here, but um, alien encounters, a sudden. <laughs> a it's on my sudden, bingo card. Uh, can, sudden contact with the alien species is that on the table? I think it. I think it is. I think it is. Honestly, with um, with Pluto in it. So we had this Pluto and Aquarius preview, 2023, um, March, April, uh, May, June. And this was, if you saw what happened at that time, this was when this figure of David Grush emerges talking about how the US is supposedly deconstructing um, craft some, uh, by, that's run by non-human intelligences. I don't know if it's true or not, or it's some sort of you know, delusion or so operation, but whatever it is, the theme came up in a loud way in that preview period. And I'm expecting it to come back. It will come back with Pluto and Aquarius. And I think sooner rather than later, and a Jupiter-Uranus conjunction, whilst those two planets are in orb, it's going to take a few weeks, but it would be a time with ripe for sort of revelations around that subject. Yeah, I mean, you've said that the Pluto and Aquarius was associated with like sort of foreign culture, cultural meetings between like, you know, Marco Polo going to China and bringing back all of these ideas, those two civilizations almost was like 
at that time was like equivalent to an alien encounter because there hadn't been any contact between those two civilizations, right? So um, that's something Pluto in Aquarius, the 20 year period, uh, could we encounter uh, futuristic alien technologies? Uh, could there be an encounter with an alien civilization? Um, it's something that a lot of people are talking about these days and it's not crazy anymore. I mean, there's Netflix shows about it. The New York Times is writing about it. Uh, you know, mainstream media is 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 really uh, becoming becoming more acceptable, right? The U.S. government just started a whole branch uh, to, uh, about you know looking at the UAP phenomenon and trying to understand what's going on there. So this is an issue that we're definitely going to be seeing and talking about a lot more with Pluto and Aquarius as well. Um, so we're out of time here today, and I think we covered a lot of territory. And thanks for your great insights and your great historical you know, sort of uh, references, uh, Dan, you've got, you've done a lot of research and, um, you know, it's uh, a very good work that you've been doing. And where can people find out more information about your world astrology reports? Well, uh, the first place is YouTube. If you just look for world astrology report on YouTube, you'll find my channel. Uh, I also have a Substack, uh, worldastrologyreport.substack.com. I haven't written anything for that uh, recently, although I'm probably going to be restarting that quite soon. Um, so those are the major places. And also uh, X, Twitter, I'm on there as at Dan W. Astro. Do you have a website? I do. It's uh, danwaitsastrology.com. It's for bookings. However, I'm not currently taking bookings for consultations. I'm taking a break from that to focus on some other stuff. So um, th there is that website, but you won't find much there except for the ability to book with me, which, which I'm not Got it. allowing Got right it. now. <laughs> well, I'm I'm Astro Crypto Guru on X Twitter and Crypto Domus. This is the Crypto Domus Astrology channel. If you're interested in my financial astrology work, you can check out my website. It's www.astrocryptoreport.com. And uh, my Patreon is where we do most of our financial astrology in-depth analysis for cryptocurrencies and stock markets. So go ahead and check that out um, if you're not already checking that out. Um, so thanks for joining us today. And um, I haven't done a video in a long time, actually. This is my first video I've done this year. I kind of um, been so busy <laughs> with crypto and other and consultations. I haven't had time to do a YouTube stuff, but I really appreciate uh, Dan joining us uh, today. And I think this is a great video. I hope it's helpful to astrology uh, practitioners and students everywhere. And we'll see you guys next time. Take care and be well.